وتصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of بقيت الله الأعظم روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء in Latin your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad When you and I examine Islamic history, one interesting realization emerges regarding the dates of a number of battles and expeditions during the time and the illustrious life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. A number of these battles happened in the month of Shawwal. For example, Battle of Uhud. For example, the Battle of Khandaq and a number of others. For example, the Ghazwa of Bani Quraidha and so on. A number of them happened in the month of Ramadan, such as the Battle of Badr. As well as, of course, one of the most important pivotal moments in Islamic history and one that has been highlighted in the Holy Quran as a key significant development and that is the conquest of Mecca, Fatih Mecca. Someone may ask the question, why all these battles happened in the month of Ramadan and Shawwal? There are 12 months of the year. Why is it these two that we find the majority of battles taking place? One of the reasons, and Allah knows best, seems to be that there is a message here that Rabbil Alameen is telling humanity that you and I are on a continuous battle in our lives against the nafs, against desires, against shaitan. This is, of course, Jihad al-Akbar. But even when it comes to Jihad al-Azghar, which is the battle in the battlefield, an individual gains strength and power and izza through devotion and ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah saying, through this siyam and this fasting, not only do you get spiritual strength, but you get physical strength. These battles happening in the month of Ramadan and Shawwal, not a coincidence. Everything is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. In the next few days, starting from tomorrow, the 10th of Ramadan, is the beginning of the remembrance of Fatih Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. Now, interesting in the Quran, and this is where we need to constantly dig deep and reflect. In the Quran, Allah has used Fatih and Nasr. Chapter 48, Surah Al Fatih. Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Chapter 110, is Surah Al Nasr. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Fatih means something that opens up. Nasr means a victory. These two are used in the Quran only, please understand this, only for battles of the Prophet that did not involve violence or killing people. Today when they tell you Islam, violence, terrorism, this... Say to them, you have not understood the Qur'an or the teachings of the Prophet of Islam. Those other battles, yes, they are legitimate and Allah praises, but doesn't use Nasr or Fatih for Badr, Hunayn, for example, for Uhud. Any of these battles are not used, the terms Fatih or Nasr. Yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the most powerful victory is when Islam is spread without the need to use any force. That's the most powerful. Yes? Fatih, what happened? This was a peace treaty in the year 6 after Hijra in the place called Hudaybiyah. And Nasr is the conquest of Mecca. Sometimes people confuse. They think, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina is the conquest of Mecca. Although some Mufassirin have pointed to the possibility 
that may refer to this. Now, when we remember the conquest of Mecca, Fatih Mecca, there are a number of key things for you and I when we study history, the biography of the Holy Prophet of Islam, when we reflect on them, there are a number of things for us to indeed ponder and understand and link Quranic ayat to the historical incident itself. Many of us know that the only messenger, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, entered Mecca peacefully. And this happened on the 20th of Ramadan, year 8 after Hijrah. And alhamdulillah, this was a pivotal moment in Islam where many joined the religion. But what happened before is very important and crucial for us to remind ourselves without shadow of a doubt because these are the days of the particular incident or the event itself. We are told that when the Prophet of Islam left Mecca, on the eve of the first of Rabi'ul Awwal. We are mu'mineen and mu'minat who must study sometimes some of these matters in the right way, yes? According to the narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt, the Hijri Islamic calendar is not from the first of Muharram. It's from Rabi'ul Awwal. This is what, what was under the direction of the Prophet of Islam, under the direction of Amir al muminin But some individuals changed it to first of Muharram. Because Hijri means what? Hijra. The Prophet left Mecca when? Not Muharram. He left in Rabi' al-Awwal. Eve of Rabi' al-Awwal, he left Mecca towards Medina. So in reality, the Hijri calendar should start in Rabi' al-Awwal. But sadly today we have it starting in Muharram, which we have to just go with. Yes? Because as it is, it has developed throughout history. That's how it is. But just for you to know that Rabi' al-Awwa should be the beginning. When he left, he looked towards Mecca and he cried. Allah revealed to him the following verses. Because he loved the city. He wanted to stay in the city. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِي فَرَضَ عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لَرَادُّكَ إِلَى مَعَادٍ Allah said to him, don't worry. I have revealed the Quran for you. I promise you, you will return to Mecca. You definitely will. Subhanallah. Ma'ad here is used what? Mecca. Ma'ad is a belief in the day of Qiyamah. That means what? We return to that which we were created for. We have been created for Akhirah. Yes. We return to that place. Therefore, the Prophet of Islam went to Medina, established the Islamic State successfully, brilliantly led as a skillful statesman, leader of the community. Fast forward six years after Hijrah, Hudaybiyah Treaty is signed. There is an agreement between Muslims and Quraysh that anyone who becomes Muslim is not attacked. Anyone who stands with Quraysh is not attacked. It's a 10-year treaty. And therefore you find that there was a particular tribe by the name of Bani Khuza'a. This Bani Khuza'a aligned with the Prophet. When they aligned with the Prophet, they became Muslim. When they became Muslim, they were protected by Islam. Two years later, there was a battle of Mu'ta, whereby Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, radhuanullahi ta'ala alayhi, became martyred. Muslims were unfortunately defeated by the Romans. They had to retreat back. On the way back, this Bani Khuza'a, in the month of Sha'ban, were attacked by Quraysh. Twenty of them were martyred. The head goes to Medina and says, Ya Rasulullah, we were supposed to be protected. Look at Quraysh, they have violated the pact. The Prophet of Islam says very well, we must now conduct the next steps in total confidentiality and secrecy. First lesson, not everything should be put on Facebook. First lesson, mashallah, mu'mineen, mu'minat, everything that happens in their lives, there are asrar, there are some secrets, not everything can be said. Not everything shared online. Yes, there are secrets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this particular area, the Prophet of Islam says, we will now formalize and indeed mobilize this army, but without anyone knowing. Yes, and we will march towards Mecca. There was a singer by the name of, according to Riwayat, Sarah. She had property in Mecca. She had some belongings. And she wanted to, she had weak iman, she was probably a hypocrite. She took a letter, her husband um, 
was supporting her, yes, and she moved towards Mecca to tell them that the army of Muslims is coming. The Prophet of Islam said to Amir al-Mu'mineen and said to Zubair, you catch up with her, take this letter from her, because she has this letter, she will disclose this plan. Amir al-Mu'mineen goes with Zubair. They reach her, she is what? Going towards Mecca in the deserts. They say to her, where is the letter? She says, I swear by Allah, I don't have any letter. So they search, Zubair searches her belongings. He looks at Amir al-Mu'mineen and says, Khalas, no letter. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, why Allah, I will not leave here until I get the letter. Rasulullah says a letter. What do you mean there's no letter? You know, this is the difference between a true Sahabi of the Prophet and someone else. Rasulullah says there's a letter. Today, when the Prophet of Islam says, for example, Inni tarikum fikum lan tadhillu ba'di abada, you will not go astray if you hold on to the Quran and the Ahl al Bayt. The Prophet of Islam does not speak from himself. Amir al Mu'mineen took out what? The sword, Dhul Fiqar, said to her, You don't give me the letter? This. She said, Okay, turn around. She took the letter from her folds of her hair she gave it to amir al-mu'mineen and she returned with them the prophet of islam condemned her what she did and the army now moves interesting incident happened just outside medina when they passed haddit tarakhus yes the 22 kilometers the prophet of islam looked at the army of muslims and said to them now it's the time to break your fast if the Prophet tells you to do something, how dare anyone debate? But subhanAllah, we have people that time debated the Prophet and argued against Ahl al-Bayt, and we have some today as well. Yes? They looked at the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to keep fasting. The Prophet said, I'm telling you, you have to break your fast. They said, no, we prefer to fast. Ajib. The Prophet is telling you break, and you want to... Then the Prophet said his famous line, Innahum humul usat. They are the disobedient ones. These are people questioning the Prophet of Islam. Yes? Now, they continue, the army continues until they reach an area outside Mecca. Now, this particular area is called Dahran, just on the outskirts of Mecca. And Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, the uncle of the Holy Prophet who had embraced Islam a few years earlier, and had gone back to Mecca practicing taqiyya, so many examples of dissimulation, taqiyya, during the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam, during the life of Musa, so many examples of people concealing their faith, such a Quranic concept. He said to the Aad Quraysh, that you know there is a big army approaching, huge army approaching, you have no ability to defeat it. Abu Sufyan said, very well, let's go and see. So he left Mecca, he went to at night. The plan of the Muslims was what? The Holy Prophet of Islam said, light up these candles more than your numbers. So Abu Sufyan looks at the candles that there were so many, he begins to shake. Yes, the Muslims were several thousand, but they had more candles than there were as numbers. Yes, he, there's a famous long story regardless. He comes and he says to the Prophet, okay, no problem. Incidentally, he had tried earlier to come to Medina to calm the situation, according to him. After they had attacked this Bani Khuzayma, he tried to calm the situation, but he was unsuccessful. Even his own daughter, Um Habiba, she said, I don't want to see you. Yes? And he was sitting on a mat, mattress. She pulled it from underneath him. Because she says, I'm not interested in seeing you. Yes, He was... Indeed, disrespected in Medina. Now, he saw the number of Muslims. He said to the Prophet of Islam, we will not fight you. You are, yes, we are surrendering in this particular way. Of course, one particular Sahabi, unfortunately, forced him and said, if you don't become Muslim, we will kill you. Yes, well-known Sahabi who usually forces people to become Muslim and is usually quite violent. Now, he embraced Islam because of this. He embraced Islam and he was not a true Muslim. In other words, he did not necessarily believe in it just by force. 
Yes? He said, I will. Okay, no problem. You're going to kill me. I'll become Muslim. There's no such thing. Yes? Forcing people to become Muslim. Anyway, now, he leaves the Prophet of Islam. Next day, marches towards Mecca. Now, this is another beautiful lesson and the Quran now highlights, which is what? That Rasulullah Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam When he enters Mecca, he enters it with full humility, with tawaf, his head down, yes, amongst the battalions that were entering Mecca. He was not in any shape or form boastful or practicing ostentation or showing off. And he enters Mecca with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once the army, Muslim army, enters Mecca, the first destination is al kaabatul Musharrafa. The first place that the Prophet of Islam went was the Holy Kaaba. Inside the Kaaba there were, according to the Riwayat, 360 idols in addition to some of the well-known idols, yes, such as Hubal, the biggest one. The Prophet of Islam with Amir al-Mu'mineen begin to destroy these idols until the last one was left. It was very tall. Yes, needed two human beings to destroy. This is an important moment in history. Yes, because the Prophet of Islam said what? Said, Ya Ali, stand on my shoulders and bring down this idol. Yes, they were both reciting, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقَ This, these narrations are found in a number of the books of Muslims, for, such as Mustadrak, volume 3, page 5, and Musnad Ahmed ibn Hanbal, volume 1, page 84, just to highlight what Amir al muminin said when he went on the shoulders of the Prophet of Islam. They said to him later, Ya Ali, what did you feel and see? Yes. He said, وَخُيِّلَ لِي أَنِّي لَوْ شِئْتُ نِلْتُ أُفَقَ السَّمَاءِ He says, the moment I went up and I was on the shoulders of Rasulullah, I can see and the heavens opened up for me. I could see many things. Yes. Then he came down. But when he came down, he did not fall in an abrupt way. It's like soft as if something brought him down. So he smiled and the Prophet smiled. So the Prophet of Islam looked at him and says, why are you smile? He says, when I came down, it was very gentle. Normally when you land, yes, you've you fall in a hard place, the floor. The Prophet says, why should you fall on a hard face? وَقَدْ رَفَعَكَ Muhammad wa anzalaka Jibra'il. Muhammad raised you. Jibra'il helped you down. Yes. In the recognition that this was an important moment for Muslims to see. That this haqq وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ can only be established through the Prophet of Islam. Not only by himself and Amir al muminin so The Prophet by himself could have destroyed the idols. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. But these are all important messages for whom? The Muslims. Now, the ayah, the ayahs in the Quran, Surah Al-Nasr, is a beautiful surah that most of us recite. Most of us have memorized, alhamdulillah. And there are beautiful recommendations from the Holy Prophet is narrated that whomsoever recites Surah Al-Nasr, yes, in the salah, in every fadila, in mustahab, according to a narration from Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad and al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salam Man qara'aha faka'annama shahida ma'a rasulillahi fatha Mecca. Whomsoever recites it, it's as if you join the Prophet in the conquest of Mecca. And the sixth Imam then goes on to say, Whoever recites it, نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ جَمِيعَ أَعْدَائِهِ Allah gives them victory over their enemies. So sometimes if you're finding a difficulty with your enemy, somebody that you are, somebody's hurting you, recite Surah, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ It helps. But don't use it between husband and wife. Huh? <laughs> so, this is a beautiful Surah. What is the gist of the Surah? What's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying in this chapter of the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Nasr? Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Yes, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينَ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ Now, this ayah, many Mufassirin say, was revealed before the conquest of Mecca. Before, before. Some say six after Hijrah, some say seven after Hijrah. Interesting. Yes, and the Prophet of Islam was telling 
through the revelation to people that this is what's going to happen. Yes. Al-Abbas, the uncle, began to cry. He said, when I heard this, I knew that after this, the Prophet of Islam would leave this world because Islam now has firmly established and the Arabs, the Quraysh and others believed that a true prophet cannot be a true prophet unless they conquer Mecca. Because they say Abraha wanted to establish that he is a true what leader tried to conquer Mecca, but he was destroyed. So they say anyone who is not able to do it is not a true prophet. So this was also a sign for the people. Anyway, Quran says, how should you deal with a victory or success in your life? What are the three steps the Quran says you should implement and demonstrate when Allah bestows favors upon you, when Allah helps you, when Allah supports you in any cause. Of course, this was fatah, conquest, but it could be anything in our lives, isn't it? That's why the Quran says this three-step process is essential for success. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ So there is tasbih, there is hamd, and there is istighfar. إِنَّهُ كَانَ tawaba. Today nations, when they celebrate certain things, they hold gatherings and celebrations and food. Sometimes it's okay, as long as there's no disobedience of Allah. But Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, notice how a whole month of Ramadan, fasting, devotion, dedication, ibadah, salah, Quran, dua, the most important thing to celebrate is salah in Eid. Yes, salatul Eid and zakatul fitra. Allah says it's a holistic celebration. Yes, fasabbih bihamdi rabbik. This tasbih is tanzih. That means you exonerate and you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no deficiency, has no limitations. Yes. This tasbih usually is coupled with hamd. Subhana rabbi al azimi wa bihamdi. Subhana rabbi al a'la wa bihamdi. It is usually supported with a praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It must do. How can we stand? To say that there is no limitations to Allah, that He's all powerful, all mighty, all majestic, but not praise Him. And finally, wastaghfir. This is the most interesting. When we attain success, somebody, for example, gets the best grades in an exam. Great achievement, alhamdulillah. Or when somebody, for example, is blessed with children, Allah says that's the moment to say istighfar. Ajeeb. But I didn't do a sin, it's a moment of happiness. Allah Taala says, I want to protect you. In case anything enters your heart, you start believing this is from you. Any pride, any form of arrogance, anything. This is not for the Prophet of Islam. Yes, This is for you and I. It's not for the Ahl al-Bayt. It's for you and I. A lesson when the Quran sometimes addresses the Prophet of Islam, it is because he's the leader of the Muslims so that the Muslims learn. Yes, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ now, after all these three, there is more emphasis on istighfar than the others. Innahu kana tawaba. Yes? Because without the process of istighfar, the human being is not able to progress and it's a defense mechanism against temptations of shaitan, temptations of the desire of the nafs, less than individual believes. And today, subhanAllah, you see mu'mineen, mu'minat, achieving great things in life. When you ask them, how did you achieve? They say, hard work. First thing they say, it was really hard. I struggled all my life. Now I'm seeing the fruits. And then they teach their children, make sure you work really hard. Okay, that's not the first thing that you should say. The first thing above all, one of that comparison and what we should be educating our children, قُلْ كُلُّمْ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Everything that I have is from Allah. It's not mine. And it's not my efforts. He blessed me with it. Then talk about hard work. Yes, that's what the important message in this particular surah and in this incident, yes, is highlighting in Islamic history. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq to serve him in the best possible way to practice tasbih and hamd and istighfar and to be of those who follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ida jaa nasrullahi wal-fatih wa ra'ayta al-nas yadkhuluna fi din Allahi afwaja fasabbih bihamd rabbika wa astaghfiruhu innahu kana tawwaba.
أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا إله إلا هو الحليم الكريم غافر الذنب وقابل التوب وهو الغفور الرحيم سبحان من سبقت رحمته غضبه وبسط اليدين بالرحمة سبحان من لم يكلف نفسا إلا وسعها وعفى عن السيئات ولم يجاز بها سبحان من لا يزداد على معاصي العباد إلا كرما وجودا وعلى كثرة الذنوب إلا عفوا وصفحا نشهد أن لا إله إلا هو العطوف على العباد بجوده والعواد على المذنبين بحلمه ونشهد أن محمد نبيه وحبيبا سيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين بعثه رحمة للعالمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الداعين إلى سبيل الله بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة قادة الأمم وأولياء النعم ومعدن الرحمة There is an interesting story related to an important thing that's happening to our lives in the next week There was a, in one of the cities a doctor who, mashallah, his work was very good and he saved the life of one of the richest people in that city because he was going through an illness, so he did so well. This rich man came to him and said, I want to reward you, and I have a warehouse, and it has everything that I have stored in my life, yes? And I have also presented you there with food, and there is gold and coins and jewelry and whatever, and there is beautiful furniture, whatever. You have six hours to take whatever you want from it, Anything you want for six hours, you can take. I'm giving you keys, six hours. It's yours for six hours. You're free. Bismillah. He said, very nice. Thank you. Took the keys, opened. First, there was three big rooms. First room had so much food. So he came. He said, okay, I have six hours. Let's spend one hour eating. So he starts eating, eating, eating. Mashallah, different foods he has been presented. Everything. Then he felt a bit heavy. He went to the next room. It has beautiful bed, sofa, everything. Really nice. He said, okay, now it's been two hours. Let me rest a bit. Then, because I feel heavy, six hours too long I have, yes? So then he rested on the sofa and the bed. Then he felt someone waking him up. What happened? He said, your six hours is over. You need to leave. He said, wait, I haven't taken anything from the third room. You know, the... No, they said, خلاص. out, out. Yes? We are approaching the nights of Qadr. Yes? This wonderful opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, amazing, amazing, beautiful treasure and gift from Rabbil Alameen Jalla wa Ala. Yes? Cannot ever be, we can never ever be thankful enough to Allah for this glorious moments in the holy month of Ramadan. Some mu'mineen and mu'minat, they often approach the month of the Layal al Qadr with this mindset. Yes, either they say, Alhamdulillah, we have really long time, so we will do some amal here, this, that, right? Or they approach it with the mindset that I have to do every single amal, and when I do it, it's okay. Khalas. So a tick list exercise for amal. I was in New Zealand a few years ago, Auckland, for a month of Ramadan, about six, seven years ago. And New Zealand at that moment had the longest night of Qadr of the whole planet. So iftar was at five, fajr was about eight. Can you imagine how long? So I remember with the mu'mineen, we started a'mal. By 12, 1 p.m., all the a'mal were done, including 100 rukats. Now mu'mineen came and said, okay, Khuda Hafiz, we're going to sleep. I said, what do you mean? It's a night of Qadr, we have done all the a'mal. What do you want me to do now? It's done. Tick, 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 tick. Dua Abu Hamza, done. Raf al Masahif, done. Joshan al Kabir, done. Two rukats, done. It's my hundred rukats, done. Khalas, what do you want me to do now? I have done all the amal. I need to go to sleep. This approach is where we unfortunately limit ourselves in this unbelievable opportunity to grab as much as we can, but also in terms of quality. Not only the quantity. Meaning what? For example, some people say, why I am not benefiting much from the month of, uh, from the nights of Qadr? Do you know why? Because preparation for the nights of Qadr must take place at least a week or two weeks or even before the month of Ramadan. Meaning, today we are recommended your food that you eat on those nights, leading to those nights, reduce. 
Don't expect to, you know, mashallah, stay up in ibadah and focus the whole nights, the three nights, 19, 21st, 23rd, and you have had, mashallah, the most biggest iftari and sahari ever. You're not going to be able to focus, yes? If your physical health is not conducive to you receiving these lights from Allah, ta'ala. similarly sleep, yes? You might think, but these are, you know, I don't need to sleep. You will eventually, yes, feel tired, not only physically tired, mentally tired, not be able to focus on what you're reciting, what you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the night of the Quran, isn't it? And some mu'mineen, mu'minat, they forget this. Yes, we recite Quran, Surah Ankabut, yes, Surah Turum, Surah Dukhan on the night of the 23rd. No doubt, this is good. They look at this in a ritualistic way, right? But it's the night of the Quran, meaning what? Meaning that an important segment of the night should be dedicated not only to recitation, but to reflection, pondering, ilm. How many people on the night of Qadr say, I'm going to spend one hour seeking tafsir and ilm of the Quran? Because one of the most important acts in the night of Qadr is seeking knowledge. Ulama, maraja, they say, khalas, I am dedicating two, three hours, whatever, seeking ilm on the nights of Qadr. Ilm! Yes, on these special nights. Yes? Similarly, when I approach these uh, a'mal, they are very important to do. I am not underestimating them. It's really important for us to do these a'mal. However, I need to approach these a'mal of the night of Qadr on what it means to me in my life. When I place the Quran on my head and say, Bi Aliyan, Bi Fatima, Bi Hassan, yes? I need to develop the culture of what taking the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt as my role models and learning from them. But also, if there is a moment in my life where the Ahl al-Bayt have said something and I feel something else, I must choose them. I must choose what they have instructed. Yes, when there is conflict in my life, what does it mean I put the Quran on my head? It means it, it's ahead of me. It means it supersedes me. I need to be thinking about this when the Quran is on my head. How many times in my life maybe I didn't do this? Similarly, when I recite the two rakat namaz, salah, and I say 70 times, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilay, I need to now, now, before next week, yes, before the start of these nights of Qadr that will happen, inshallah, yes, starting from not this Sunday, the one after, in a nice 10 days or so to prepare, I need to do what? I need to list maybe 70 sins I have committed. Yes. Yes, we need to list. Sit down. How many times after this salah, I'm looking at these 70 sins and say, Astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa atubu ilay. Or is it I'm just saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, right? and in my mind is, when is Sahari time? <laughs> or when is this going to be over? It's a bit boring. I need to make it live. You know, live means that it really applies. Now, one of the recommendations from the school of Ahl al-Bayt is, in the night of Qadr, start a project. Start a good initiative, even if it's a small. This is a night of barakah. Yes? Inna anzannahu fi laylatin mubarakah. Yes, I know there's an Anna anzannahu fi laylatin qad. Inna anzannahu fi laylatin mubarakah. This layla is full of barakah, meaning what? Anything you start on that night, or these nights, any of the nights, yes, is what? Is going to be multiplied, is going to be blessed in so many ways. And approach the three nights that one completes the other. I am surprised in some of our mu'mineen around the world calendars, they put the eve of 23rd, the night of Qadr. Who told you? Who said it's definitely? Yes, it's the most likely, Laylatul Juhani, but we can't be 100%. So you can't put night of Qadr. Say a night of Qadr. Oh, put all of them as night of Qadr. Yes? Can't be absolutely sure that it's the night of 23rd. Yes, it's the most likely from the narrations. But all of them we utilize. That's why I see some mu'mineen in some, and I end with this. Sometimes in the Western world, I don't know here, in Dar or in Africa. But if the night of 19th, eve of 19th, falls on the weekend, they say we stay up this night. But the 23rd, if it falls on a working day, no, no, Mawlana, I have work next day. So it's a convenience. It's, I call it the night of Qadr of convenience. If tomorrow I don't have work, I will stay up. But if I, I, if I have work, even if it's the 23rd, no, 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 no. I will do the 19th. Three nights, three days of the year, don't work from the early morning. Start later or whatever. Do whatever it takes. 
Yes, these are Allah saying here, I like this particular very simple example. Take, take as much as you want from this night. As much as you want, because your next year is going to be what? Formed on this particular night. We pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq, to be able to utilize Laylatul Qadr in the best, best possible way. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyid al mursaleen wa shafi'i al mudnabin nabiyyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. وعلى إمام المسلمين وقائد الغر المحجلين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب وعلى سيدة نساء العالمين وبضعة خاتم النبيين سيدتنا فاطمة بنت رسول الله وعلى الحسن المجتبى والحسين الشهيد بكربلاء وعلى أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي عليهم أفضل الصلاة والسلام اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان ما حيا ثار البدع والطغيان هادم أبنية الشرك والنفاق حاصد فروع البغي والشقاق صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى أبائه الكرام ما اتصل الليالي والأيام اللهم عجل فرجه وسحل مخرجه واكحل ناظرنا بنظرة منا إليه واجعلنا من المستشهدين بين يديه وتفضل على أمرائنا المؤمنين بمزيد التوفيقات وازدياد الإقبال وعلو الدرجات اللهم افعل بنا ما أنت أهله ولا تفعل بنا ما نحن أهله بجاه محمد وآله المعصومين صلوات الله عليهم أجمع اللهم اجعلنا ممن يذكر فتنفعه الذكرى إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم